I'm Judith Hall. Um, I'm a clinical geneticist and a pediatrician. Got interested in genetics at the University of Washington. Then we went to a place where genetics was really developing at Hopkins with Dr. Victor McCusick, and then went back to Seattle to develop the um, genetics clinics for kids at the Children's Hospital. And I worked together with an absolutely incredible orthopedist, Dr. Lynn Staley. We helped began to describe what is arthrogryposis, and we came up with the definition of it is congenital, that means present at birth, contractures, that means stiff joints, in more than one body area. So not just club feet, not just dislocated hips, you have to have it in more than one body area. You could have it just on one side, you could have two limbs involved, you could have three limbs involved, you can have four limbs, you can be asymmetric, you can be symmetric, but it is two body areas where you have contractures, limitation of movement at birth. And that's been a very useful kind of definition. Today, there are all kinds of ways of coming up with definitions, and people are refining that definition, but it's still pretty useful. You've got stiff joints at birth in two or more body areas. Well, I've been interested in arthroposis for so many years. Um, it's almost hard to count back, but in the early 70s, I had a patient come to my genetics clinic who was an identical twin. He had arthrogryposis, and his brother wanted to know whether he was at risk for having an affected child because he was getting married. So I did a lot of research in the medical literature, and it was about babies who died in the newborn period. And here was this beautiful young man, and it was his brother that wanted to know. So I decided we need to learn more about people that are living with arthrogryposis. And at the time, the Shriners Hospitals took care of a lot of kids. So we looked through the records. I got a bunch of medical students. They looked through the records at the Shriners Hospital in Portland and in Oregon. And we looked through the records at the Seattle Children's Hospital. We had over a thousand records, um, and, but there was everything under the sun. And we finally ended up with 350 records of children who didn't have anything else who had arthrogryposis. And it was just incredible because out jumped amyoplasia that we now really know is a very specific entity. Out jumped kids who just had their arms and legs involved, really hands and feet involved, that we call distal. Out jumped kids that had these big webs that were known as pterygium. And so for the first time we could begin to sort out which were the common disorders. And it was actually very gratifying because it just hadn't been done before. But these were kids who became adults who were living very well, thank you, with these disorders. So it was a really gratifying thing to begin to sort out different types, to look for what were their genetics, were they, did they run in families. We found a bunch of disorders which are just in boys that are called X-linked. Um, but it was the first time then in the 80s that we put into the medical literature all these adult ch people who lived to be adults and lived very well. Um, at that time, we began to beginning to look at the genetics. And we began to recognize some other things, like you could diagnose arthrogryposis prenatally. We began to think, could you treat it prenatally? And we began to say, well, what makes babies move in utero. So we began to think about was it going to be possible to do things before children were born as well. So it was kind of an interesting time. I would say about the 2000s were the most phenomenal time because the parent support groups began to form. And they also realized that there were many, many different types of arthrogryposis. Um, it was fun to go to those meetings because I got invited to go to the ones in Europe and England and Australia and began to hook them up with each other. Um, but of course I'm the biased to the one that's in North America. 
who just been so good about communicating, getting online, developing educational materials, I mean, and supporting all of the research that's going on and wanting to know about the research at their medical meetings. So it's been really wonderful to work with the parent support groups. And of course the best thing would be to treat it before you're born. So we looked at what kinds of things cause increased fetal movement. The embryo is the first eight weeks when you're forming organs. The fetus is trying them all out, making those organs work, taking deep breaths of fluid to expand your lungs, swallowing fluid so that the gut gets mature. If you don't move in utero, there are all kinds of secondary effects on the facial structure, on decreased lungs. So it's actually really important to move in utero. Well, it turns out there are a bunch of things that are known. If mom exercises, baby wakes up and exercises. If mom deep breathes, baby wakes up and moves around. If mom drinks caffeine, now we don't want mom to take caffeine in the first trimester, but moms don't usually know they're pregnant that early. Um, but it turns out after, after 12 weeks, if you drink coffee, Coke, tea, caffeinated beverages, baby wakes up and starts kicking and moving. So we've been hypothesizing for a long time that if there were a way to get prenatal diagnosis done, then you could in fact have a, an impact on how bad those contractures are. The other thing that you can do is be delivered earlier. This longer you're in there, not moving, the more and more connective tissue is formed around the joints. So it has to do with not moving. So we've actually advocated for babies being delivered a little bit early so that if their lungs are mature, if they will be okay. And the neonatologists know how to do this or when the right time is and the obstetricians know. But probably being delivered at 36 weeks instead of at 40 weeks means a whole month of getting stiffer. So we are advocating for that as well. We know now that getting those joints moving right in the newborn period is really important. And we know now, because much of the work that Lynn Staley did back then in the 70s was you get those things mobilized. When I started and we were doing these studies at the Portland and Spokane Shriners, everybody was casting things right away, making them more immobile. So that first four months seems like it's a window that actually there's an opportunity to get things moving better than at any time later. So many of the physicians around the world really have never heard of erythropoiesis and when they hear that the patient has it, they go look it up in the dictionary. So one of the things that the support groups have done is to develop materials for the neonatal units. All children with arthrogryposis end up being shipped to a tertiary care center. So if those materials are available at the tertiary care centers, it's fantastic because it means that the neonatologist there like know something and the parents have materials that they can read and realize they're not alone. So since arthrogryposis is only one in 3,000 babies, oftentimes in the past people would live their whole lives before they would meet anybody else. The parent support groups have just been incredible at getting adults to be engaged, at letting everybody know they're not alone. And I can tell you from my experience, I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but when another parent says, your child is going to be okay, it makes such a difference. So having the opportunity to meet with other parents, the parent support groups all over the world get online. I mean, the, the connectivity is just incredible. So what I would say is communicate, communicate, communicate. For the parent support groups to communicate, with the physicians, with the rehab, with the whole team. I mean, they're so good. 
asking questions. Why do we do it this way? Why shouldn't we do it this that way? And communicating with other rare disorders so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, this whole business about doing autopsies, for instance. I mean, you would think there would be some standard guidelines available, but they aren't. So, to my mind, everything that AMC support, TAG, the other groups are learning around the world, communicate what you're doing, learn from each other. It's a really exciting time. As well, people began to recognize genes for the common types. So at that time, what we would do is get together a bunch of patients who we thought had the same disorder. Um, and the genes began to be recognized and the technology improved. And so now, today, you can look at every single gene and see if there are any abnormalities. It's just been phenomenal what's happened with regard to genetics. So I kind of try to keep track of all this. There are now over 400 genes that when they're mutated, give you decreased fetal movement, which is the source of all of the contractures. And so we've begun to think on a different level, kind of thinking about what's happening during development, what's happening to the embryo, and then the fetus, and then the late, late fetus, that leads to decreased movement. And it can be because there are muscle problems, because there are nerve problems, because there are myelin problems, because the end plate where the nerves and the muscles connect, because the brain actually doesn't develop in a normal way. And that's helping us sort out that there may be pathways that we could actually treat. And the best example of that is in the Escobar syndrome, where there's an embryonic gene that's missing. But the adult gene is just fine, thank you. We just have to wake it up. And the best part is that the drug to treat that is already available. So can we do that in muscle? Could we get things to go back to an embryonic muscle or to mature to an adult muscle? Are there things in the brain that we could actually help go ahead and develop? So it's a really exciting time. And in looking at all those 450 genes, they actually sort into 27 pathways. Well, when you get your head around it, 27 pathways that are muscle, or nerve or myelin, you can really think about could is there a way to treat those either in utero or after you're born. So one of the other studies we've done is to look at prenatal diagnosis. It's just appalling because only 25% of really severe arthrogryposis is diagnosed between before 24 weeks. And that means that families don't aren't uh, can't take advantage of many options. They can't think about um, how would we treat this in utero. The physicians that are caring for them can't do proper planning for we need to do a c-section, needs to be in a tertiary care center, we need to have people evaluating the child right away. They can't look at are the lungs going to be developed? How do we, if we deliver these babies a little early, would they be okay and do better? because they're not stuck in those positions for so long. So one of my big pushes is going to try to get better at prenatal diagnosis so that families can be prepared and know what's going on. Some of the other areas that we're working in is getting everybody work together. So at this meeting that we're at, it's a meeting kind of perf for professionals and we're so pleased to have the parents here asking some of the best questions. But the professionals are now beginning to think about really working together. So the Shriners Hospitals are talking about really highlighting arthrogryposis and being able to look for more of the uh, kinds of, um, of genetic studies that could be done. Look at more of the treatments in utero early. Um, which disorders does early treatment work best for? Which disorders have terrible problems with the contractures coming back? And if the Shriners, who have treated these kids for, well, I know for over 40 years, um, would get involved, then we could look at the natural history, what happens to adults, what kinds of other potential complications, 
And those complications are going to be unique to each type of arthroposis. So in a way, we're turning things on, the, on their head. We're going, instead of collecting a bunch of patients with a particular disorder, we're now saying, let's get together everybody that has this mutation. If it's a mutation in a particular gene, where is that mutation? Genes are very big. They do a whole bunch of things. So where the mutation is makes a big difference. And we think that if we can get people together with those mutations, first of all, they'll learn from each other. Second of all, they'll feel like they're not the only ones in the world. And there are now mechanisms among the geneticists to talk to other geneticists and find out, even though they haven't been published, other cases with this particular disorder. So it's a really exciting time right now. People are really working together. Families are asking fantastic questions. And what we think is if we can get some guidelines about how we take care of patients developed, we can get some people working together. So out of this meeting, what I'm hoping is some guidelines about prenatal diagnosis, some guidelines about how you treat certain things that everybody agrees now are the best ways. And also begin to think about what kinds of services can we provide. Out of AMC has come the question, AMC support has come the question, can I donate my body? Whoa, wouldn't that just be fantastic? that we could really do some wonderful studies to see if it's just the joints that are affected or are other organs affected as well. So we're really at a very exciting time of people working together, asking questions that might seem naive but are actually really important. And what I hope will come out of this meeting is some policy statements, some ways of looking at things that will sort of everybody can agree this is the way to move forward. So, 2018, boy, this is going to be a turning point, I think, in what happens with arthrogryposis for the future.